Brothers and sisters, friends, enemies and neutrals, Ernie Chambers is my name and I'm back again. I turned on television, I watched the news and what to my wondering eyes should appear and what to my unbelieving ears should hear, my ears hear. This white woman, a member of Congress at a rally with Donald Trump, the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, she said that the Supreme Court decision overturning a woman's right to have an abortion is for white life, white life. It was a decision for white life. And when the, what she should have anticipated, the kick came back. She then had to cover her tracks. So these kind of people always have somebody with a shovel to try to clean up the manure that they leave behind themselves. So her publicity woman said, well, she misspoke. She meant to say right to life. Now you don't even form your mouth the same way to say white life and right to life. But this is how transparent how bodacious these white racists are, and they're everywhere, everywhere. Not every white person is a functioning and practicing racist. There are some who are racist, but they don't act on it. Now, these people who do these kind of things and make these kind of statements do not want it taught in the schools about what racism is, even though we experience it in our lives every day. When we have the experience and the racists who are afflicting us by inflicting on us all kind of harmful things, then they wanna tell us that it's not really the way we know that it is. Then we begin to understand that when a white person comes and supposedly is an ally, they've got to put up something other than words because they might be laughing behind their hand, talking about you behind your back and trying to undermine you. Now, as a black man who will have his 85th birthday, July 10th, I've seen a lot of things, I've heard a lot of things, and I've been functioning around white people all my life. From the time I was in elementary school, through Tech High School, Creighton University, Creighton Law School, US Army, white people control everything. A white person is a white person is a white person. They come up from childhood with these notions, and that's why they will say things, some of them, and say, well, I didn't even realize it was wrong. Some of them are telling their brand of truth. They did not realize some things were as racist as they are because they picked it up in church, at home, at school, at play. But here's the way we have to look at it, brothers and sisters. If somebody runs over your foot with a vehicle, it matters not if they're the best of Christians, if they don't, if they're not cruel to, to animals, if they don't beat their spouse or try to poison their spouse, all of that is irrelevant. What did they do to you? They drove the car up on the sidewalk and ran over your foot saying, oops, I'm sorry, won't get it. We have to wake up and hear the birds sing wake up and smell the coffee. And I'm gonna start this with my reading because I have some things I'm gonna to read today. An interview from November 23rd, 1992, that was being conducted by a writer with the Lincoln Journal Star, and he still is there now, his name is Don Walton. Ernie Chambers, Malcolm the Man, Let's talk with Ernie Chambers about Malcolm X. Malcolm the man and the message 
not the movie. Chambers had not yet seen Spike Lee's film when we sat down to talk. Malcolm has always been the man Chambers most identifies with. He met him once, spent about six hours with him in Omaha one summer day in 1964. Chambers was 26. Malcolm had less than a year to live. Malcolm's message is still the right message today, Chambers. That's what I said in 1992. I say it today in 2022. If white Americans come out of the movie feeling comfortable with Malcolm, they didn't hear the message very well, Chambers said. Malcolm wanted white people to feel uncomfortable about racism in America. Quote, they're not comfortable with me, Chambers says. If they're comfortable with Malcolm, they definitely did not understand his message. What he spoke was the principles according to which I have directed my life and was living that way with these ideas before I ever knew Malcolm X existed. But he brought a new slant, a new boldness, a fearlessness, a mind as sharp as a razor and spoke his truth to any audience on national television, on the radio, at various gatherings, on the streets of Harlem. Malcolm was what Malcolm was. No pretense, no play acting, and it caused him to lose his life when he was just 39 years old. And we lost not only a champion, but a role model and one who would show that you can follow what you believe and be a success. But also in this racist, bloodthirsty thirsty country, it carries a risk of your having to pay a very high price. And Malcolm paid the ultimate with his life. This interview, writes Don Walton, consists of ex excerpts from an hour's conversation. Walton, what is the message? You could capsulize it as the three Ds of self, self-devotion, self-determination, self-defense. Self-devotion, -de is being aware of what our history has been in America and in Africa, about our contributions to world civilization, about confidence, self-esteem, and self-respect. What do you mean by self-determination? It's another way of saying black nationalism. We have to acquire some land and control over that land, over what's produced on it and through it. When you have land, you can talk about economic development, about cash crops and factories and shopping malls, grocery stores and housing. What do you mean by self-defense? Malcolm always stated that he believed in being nonviolent when everyone is nonviolent. When the enemy or the oppressor becomes violent, we must respond in kind. That's the only language that's understood. If you speak only French and I speak German, you don't understand me, I don't understand you, but we all understand certain actions. And when those actions are aggressive and hurtful, then we know that this is somebody, not only that we have to watch, but somebody we will have to defend ourselves against and repel force with a countervailing force, continuing. What Malcolm really expressed was what any human being, male or female of any race in any period of history should say, quote, I as a human being have an inherent inalienable right to seek happiness and benefit for myself and my family without interference from anyone else. If Malcolm, is Malcolm's message clearly understood today? Many white people and some of their Negro, and I use that term pejoratively, that means 
as an insult. Flunkies want to emphasize his ecumenical attitude as if he embraced all white people. They are uncomfortable with an unadulterated Malcolm X. I don't believe Malcolm changed that much after his trip to Mecca. He still talked about self-determination and self-defense and control over our own organizations. And that's something white people everywhere and anywhere are opposed to. I say again, and I'm not gonna keep saying it, not every white person is like this, but if they don't separate themselves from the crowd, if their actions don't back up their words, they may as well be put in the same boat, in the same bag, because they're in the same mob, which would take our life if we stood still for it. An example of adulteration, some middle-class black people and some white people will when they have to deal with Malcolm's characterization of whites as blue-eyed devils, try to validate his position by saying that was a long time ago when terrible things were being done. And so the characterization was not out of line then. My response is that things have grown worse. If when Malcolm was alive, white people, but not every white person, could be characterized as blue-eyed devils, they remain blue-eyed devils today. Update a devil as you will, a devil is a devil still. How do we confront racism? It requires the cooperation and collaboration of very strong, principled, uncorruptible black and white people with the courage to attack the monster by any means necessary. How about the movie? The majority of black and Negro people who flocked to the premiere showing would not have been caught dead in Malcolm's presence when he was alive. So many of them are accommodators and temporizers. That is when they deal with white people on a day-to-day -day basis. Many of them tried to convert Malcolm into an integrationist and a lover of all white people, regardless of their conduct toward us, blurring what Ma Malcolm really was and the essence of what made him so appealing. Why is his message still the right one? It's the same as if a person had polio today. Since the disease has not changed, neither has the cure for it. What would you hope might be the effect of the movie? I'll bet you won't find many people who see it, who say the problems that Malcolm talked about are still here today, and I've got to get about trying to help solve them. If they don't leave the movie with the idea that they've got to do something to solve the problem, they've missed the message. And people like Malcolm, do not live a long life as I wish they should. When the Supreme Court overturned the right of a woman to have an abortion, they became those who are on crotch watch. Their nose is always sniffing around a woman's private parts. They're always concerned about what's going on in a bedroom and yet they don't have what it takes to mind their own business. If they minded their own business, they wouldn't have time to get into everybody else's. And Uncle Tom Clarence Thomas did tip their hand. He said that abortion, the, the guy who wrote the, the opinion was Alito. Ford joined him in overturning Roe versus Wade. The chief justice joined them to make it six against three by upholding the Mississippi law that had been brought by the court, brought to the court. He wanted to uphold that law, but he would not vote to overturn Roe against Wade. Therefore, five of the racists came out and showed what they were. The chief justice did not join them in that part of the opinion. 
Clarence Thomas said that other rights that were manufactured by a court should not be upheld as constitutional rights because they were not contemplated by those who wrote the Constitution. Did those who write the Constitution know anything about electrified cars? Did they know about internal combustion engines? Did they know about jet planes, drones, ways to, in, well, I guess you could say intrude on other people's private space? There are a lot of things that could not be contemplated and anticipated by those who wrote the Constitution and the ones who voted to implement it. Chief Justice John Marshall, considered the greatest of them all, came up with a power for the court which is not mentioned in the Constitution. And what is that power? The power to overrule Congress on anything Congress enacts. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that, but because it gives the court this power, Clarence Thomas and the ones who would say that the right of a woman to have an abortion is not constitutionally protected because it's not referred to in the Constitution, don't want to say that they should not have the powers that they exercise because they are not spelled out in the Constitution. This is a white man's world, a white man's game, and Clarence Thomas is one of their flunkies, married to a racist white woman from Omaha, who when she married him, her family said, it's all right, because he's a good, clean, colored boy. He had a religious experience, as they call it, on the kitchen floor in their house, and they described it. He fell on the floor, rolled around on the floor, and talked about getting Jesus. And he has been their lap dog ever since. He is worse in some respects than the average white racist because he knows better, but he has a white woman cracking that whip over him. The January 6th Congressional Investigating Committee, looking at that, what they call a riot or insurrection against the Capitol building and the occupants, including all these Republicans. Anyway, they want to call her to testify. She was one of those who openly spoke against the validity of the election. And here he's sitting on the Supreme Court. Five people control this country because five of the nine is the number it takes to impose their will on everybody as long as everybody's willing to accept it but they're going to overplay their hand. And they'll be told, as Andrew Jackson told the court, when there was a dispute about a national bank, John Marshall has made his decision, let him enforce it. And that's what people are going to say about the Supreme Court. They're not going to accept these decisions, these opinions that are written to support those, decision, those, those decisions will be mocked, laughed at, and turned into toilet paper. What these people, the vast majority of whom in America are opposed to what the Supreme Court did, should have their demonstrations. They should keep them going. That generates power. But after the demonstration, they need to head to the courthouse register and vote what the Republicans may have done in their haste to take away a woman's right to an abortion is to upset these white women in the suburbs. They have a higher level of education. They have a higher economic standard. And they're the ones that the Republicans were looking for to turn the tide for them. And now these women are very upset about what the court did and telling women, you're going, going back to the dark ages. It's a man's world, a white man's world, plus an Uncle Tom, for good measure. You have to have a little dab of pepper to kind of mitigate all of that white salt. And we're going to see what happens 
as these midterm elections occur, as some of these primaries occur. If these white women don't get out and vote, then the white men are gonna say, they're just like we always said, Shakespeare de de described them perfectly, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing as a tale told by an idiot. So if you don't vote, you're not going to be listened to. And that goes especially for black people. Right now, black women die, die from childbirth at a far higher rate than white women. All areas of medical care find us on the short end of the stick. Since more black women are dying in childbirth, more are going to die as a result of not being able to obtain abortions. And if they have a medical condition, these white doctors don't have to work with them on a doctor patient relationship because they could say, well, I don't know if this baby is lost, this fetus, they might say that I performed an abortion and I'll go to jail. So I'm sorry, but I, I can't handle your case. And they can hide their racism behind that opinion, that decision handed down by the Supreme Court when they overturned Roe versus Wade. We have to learn to look beyond the surface, see what is under the hood of the car, what the engine looks like, what it is inside that engine that generates the power that turns the motor and the parts that are necessary to allow the car to move. We get caught up on the appearance. If we don't register and vote, and vote intelligently, then the good old days, as white people will call them, of lynching, I assure you, will return. The openly segregated schools, the denial of employment opportunities, blatant insurance redlining of certain areas where black people live and insurance will not be made available. Oh, it'll be offered sometimes, but at an exorbitant rate. If your house is worth $50,000, they say, well, your premium is $72,000 a year. We're not denying you insurance. We're business people. We're not nonprofits. We're not in the business of charity. If you can't pay the price, that's tough. White people have ways of beating us out of our property. There was a time during the 60s when I was hopeful that the younger generation would see the value of education, all types of education, scientific, learn about mathematics, obviously the law and medicine but that has not panned out. We always look to the next generation because the one of which we are a part is such a disappointment and we know they're not going to change. So it seems that a natural part, maybe you could say an essential necessary part of a human being's makeup is that concept of hope. As bad as everything is now, it can be better. And we're not talking about pie in the sky in the sweet by and by, but these young people who are here now, who will witness the bad things going on, decide that they themselves are better than that and will not be a part of it and may become better people than the adults who came before them, not by duplicating, replicating, or copying the bad example of white people who are adults, but by learning from them and vowing that that is not what they're going to become. Those are not the things that they will do. Because I wanted to reach out to young people everywhere, I gave talks all over the country. 
mainly to white groups. They were the ones extending the invitations from other states. They're the ones who had the money. They could pay transportation and give what they called an honorarium. And they would come in droves. They heard about me before I got there and they wanted to see, I guess, and hear, I suppose, this black man who can hang 10 words together and make sense. We'll know how to diagram a sentence. We'll know the subject from the predicate We'll know the difference between a predicate noun, a predicate adjective, a direct object. We'll know the eight parts of speech and how to use each one of them effectively. So I guess they came to see a spectacle, but they got something else from me. And I never gave a talk without leaving an opportunity for all these white people, whoever they might be, to ask me questions. I'm on the stage alone. I never had an entourage, never had bodyguards, never carried a weapon. And these people would become irate and furious. And I knew they would be that way, but there were men like Malcolm who braved their hostilities, even though he was a member of an out organization. Stokely Carmichael would speak. He was the, a member of an organization. H. Rap Brown, all of those men who were speaking and women, Angela Davis and others showed the way. If words could be a, a change maker, things would have changed. But we have to find receptive people who are willing to act on these fine principles that everybody talks about. So I told the people in the audience, I agree with Malcolm. The only stupid question is the one that's not asked. If I open myself to your questions, ask me anything you want to. And it's up to me to winnow this stuff and decide which ones I will answer and how I will answer them. Some questions were so obviously ridiculous on their face that the person wanted to use the form of a question to make a statement. And I would say the answer to what was given here is not as a response to a question to give information, but rather to counteract what he or she thought he or she was so cleverly saying by putting it in the form of a question. Those of us who have minds are sharper than white people because it is necessary for us who are put in the role of the prey to understand the predator. If the predator doesn't get this rabbit, there'll be another one coming along. And they say the rabbit has to understand the fox better because the fox is running for his dinner, the rabbit's running for his life. And what black people need to understand, you cannot run with the rabbits and hunt with the hounds. I'm going to read some things. Here's how this article is summed up. And it's kind of appropriate. It was dated March 30th, 1990. In the end, Senator Ernie Chambers of Omaha remained the uncrowned but undisputed champion of the rules of the legislative arena. Chambers played the rule book like a piano. And what was the issue? The abortion issue tied the legislature in procedural knots until nearly midnight Friday. It was the session's longest exercise yet in debate, filibuster, and procedural shadow boxing. And I always told the people, if you get in the ring with the champion, if you hit him, you better knock him out. If you strike the king, you better kill him. So know what you're doing when you 
launch hostile action and know against whom it is you're launching it. In the end, Senator Ernie Chambers of Omaha remained the uncrowned but undisputed champion of the rules of the legislative arena. He successfully led the effort Friday to stop anti-abortion proponents from winning a vote on a bill that would require that a parent be told before a minor has an abortion. When some pro-choice lawmakers thought a compromise was in order, Chambers played the rule book like a piano, never allowing the compromise plan to come up. I knew how to use the rules when it made a difference. The imbroglio began about 10 a.m. in the morning and ended at 11.19 p.m. And I was there the whole time on my feet. Senator Le Bernice LeBeds of Omaha and others who oppose abortion wanted to gut another bill and insert provisions of a parental notification measure, which has stalled at the first stage of floor debate and forced a final vote on the measure by putting it in another bill. They learned that from me, but they didn't know how to do it and they couldn't get it done because they just came with that. They knew that when I'm in action, we're dealing with something here, but I'm looking at everything on this table, everything in the room and the building. And this that happens now happens in a context. If you get the vote you want today, you may not get to vote on it again during the whole session, because all these other bills are gonna be my target. And unlike cowardly white men, I would not back down. If I said, I'm going to do it, they knew they could take that to the bank. And they wished that I was not so adamant. I was not so relentless, that I was weak. These are the things they wished for and hoped for, but they never got it from me. And it's why I got things done that nobody else did. Continuing, by 9.30 p.m., it became obvious that the chances of the anti-abortion for forces carrying the day were all but nil. Quote, we're still here, said Senator John Lindsay of Omaha. Unfortunately, reason left a long time ago. Lindsay favored the move to force a vote on the parental notification bill. Senator Howard Lamb of Anselmo said the pro-choice legislative minority was thwarting the will of the lawmaking majority. Well, I'm sure Jews were hoping that there'd be somebody to thwart what the Nazis wanted to do to them. The mere fact that the numbers are excessive doesn't mean that what the numbers want to do is right. It means that if they have enough numbers, they can force people who don't want to do it to do it, they can impose their will on people who are not willing. Senator David Landis of Lincoln, however, said yielding to the majority on the parental notification bill would do far more harm than good for disadvantaged young women and would be like acceding to a majority wish to require black people to ride in the back of the bus. Several lawmakers, including Senators, Di Senators Diana Schimmick and Don Wesley, both of Lincoln, said parliamentary maneuvering could continue endlessly and the abortion issue should be set aside so other measures could be considered. And who do you think they had in mind and would be looking at when they said this maneuvering can go on endlessly? The man who would carry it on by himself knew how to offer motions, how to offer amendments, knew how to offer what are called priority motions to put me ahead of the line so that I could attempt what I wanted before anybody else by learning their rules. They wrote the rules, but they didn't understand them and they didn't know how to use them and they didn't have to worry about them. See, white people's interests parallel. They're side by side. They intersect and come together. They overlap. So there's always somebody white who's willing to speak up in behalf of white people's issues. They don't have to count on one or even two. With us, one was all we had. And my standard response was, if Alibaba can handle 40 thieves, 
I should be able to handle 48 white people. And I said it to their face. I said it in their legislative chamber and I still got things done. I got a bill to require district elections of city councils in Omaha so that black people in North Omaha and Latinos, Chicanos, whichever term they prefer, could elect representation of our choice. Did the same thing with the county board by district, the same thing with the school board by district. It had never been done by anybody and it was done by one. But if I have only one vote and they have 48, one vote in a legislative assembly cannot carry any issue and that I know, and they know I know it. So they know that I have to find a way to get some of those votes so that I can at least have a majority of 25, 30 to override a governor, 33 to shut off debate. But what they knew I was doing was always looking beyond this one thing to other things. And that's all I'll read on that. Terry Carpenter was so strong that they called him terrible Terry and white people were terrified of him. This is what he said in 1975. i had been there about three years. I had had a chairmanship. I was chairman of the government and military affairs committee, but white people were gonna put me in my place by taking the chairmanship. White folks give it, white folks take it away. And black man should have learned his lesson and his place and stay in it. That was not for me. There was an article in the McCook Gazette and also one in the World Herald describing a talk that Terry Carpenter gave in Kearney and Carpenter referred to politics as a double, as a dirty double crossing racket. But here's the part that's interesting. In a remarkable speech here Thursday night, former state Senator Terry Carpenter said he believes state Senator Ernest Chambers hates whites and is a brilliant man. Governor J.J. Exon is a clever politician who could have swept over Demo other Democrats into office with him and politics is a dirty double-crossing racket. Speaking as the George Norris Distinguished Lecturer in Political Science at Kearney State College, Carpenter said Chambers is the one man in the unicameral who might be able to take his place if his election challenge fails. Carpenter said Chambers, quote, is one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. The only handicap is that he's black and the legislature unhorned him because he is black. In other words, took my chairmanship. The legislature, Carpenter said, stripped chambers of his chairmanship of the Military Affairs Committee, quote, because it was offended by his capabilities. He ran the committee as well as any man in the legislature ever ran a committee. Carpenter continued that, quote, I think he hates white people. I think white people give him reason to hate them. Carpenter said, few legislators can be found who will quote, get on their feet and debate with Mr. Chambers, not because he's black, but because he's superior to them in the area of knowledge, understanding and capability. The same speech being covered by a World Herald reporter. Terry Carpenter performed here Thursday night as the George Norris Distinguished Lecturer and singled out a former colleague in the legislature, quote, as one of the most brilliant men I have ever met, unquote. Quote, the legislature unhorned, unhorned him because he is black, Carpenter said, referring to Omaha State Senator Ernest Chambers, only Negro and only independent in the legislature. Carpenter said, quote, the legislature took the chairmanship of the committee from him because they were offended by his capabilities. He ran a committee as well as anyone in the legislature ever did it with complete impartiality. Chambers alone was singled out for praise by Carpenter in response to a question from his audience about who should replace Carpenter as a major force in the 49 member legislature. Carpenter was the fifth annual 
Norris Lecturer in Political Science sponsored by Kearney State College. In praising Chambers, Carpenter said, quote, he's almost without parallel. I think he hates white people. I think white people give him reason to hate them. Didn't the Bible say in the mouth of two or three words, let every word be established? They both quoted Carpenter properly. But he is brilliant. I've seen him set landmines in sequence way ahead, and they go off in sequence. Carpenter watched. Now, here's an article, really an editorial in the Lincoln Journal Star, February of 1975. I would take on the courts, the judges, and the Nebraska Bar Association. Nobody else would. I'm gonna read the, art, the editorial and try not to comment and let it speak for itself. Once again, it is Senator, and they call me Ernest in those days. Once again, it is Senator Ernest Chambers of Omaha tilting with the power of the legal fraternity. In 1974, last year, perhaps by dint of his chairing the legislature's government committee and his bill shaped at hauling bar examin and re examination reforms through the legislative gateway, Chambers skillfully roused the Nebraska Supreme Court. In response and without warning, the court one day simply directed most of the overdue improvements wanted by chambers. I offered the bill. I chaired a committee and they knew I would fight tooth and nail. So the Supreme Court consisting of seven members, the Supreme Court, not the police court, were roused to take action by the one black man in the legislature. The black man hated by most people condemned by a lot of Uncle Toms and Jemimas who would always ask, what are you doing down there? They don't read the paper, they don't pay attention. But I was moving the strongholds of government where the most powerful politicians operated. Don't tell me what one black man cannot do. Mission accomplished, legislative judicial confrontation avoided. This year, Chambers was toppled from his chairmanship. Anything they could do with votes, they could do in the legislature, but I'd make them pay a price. But his thrust upon the bar is substantially more ambitious than procedural reform. He is sponsoring a constitutional amendment, which if enacted, would allow attorneys to practice without first being forced into the Nebraska State Bar Association's membership. Realistically, Prospects must be regarded as slight for Chambers' proposal. By order of the Nebraska Supreme Court, all lawyers have to be association members, otherwise they cannot practice. This closed shop structure was decreed in 1937 by the court, acting under what it asserted are its inherent powers to regulate attorneys as officers of the court. See, it's not in the constitution. What did these white men say? And that white woman at the highest court, it's not in the constitution, it's not protected by the constitution. But when the court wants to take power for itself, they say to hell with the constitution, pardon the, the language. Some people remain unconvinced that the Supreme Court absent specific constitutional authority can muscle out the legislature from regulating this one unique profession, especially is there doubt about mandatory membership in the bar, since Nebraska has a right to work guarantee in its constitution. That means you don't have to belong to a union to hold a job. We know of another no other instance of state mandated membership in a private group as a precondition of employment. By, but granting, that the societal benefits of an integrated bar, that didn't mean by race, it meant making everybody belong, such as Nebraska's may outweigh the alternatives, does not mean the general subject is closed off from public discussion or that the legislature is barred from exercising his hand, but nobody in the legislature would stand up to them. 
Last week, a legislative committee which conducted a study of the bar, a study chambers characteristically boycotted. Why? Because it was my resolution that created the committee and they would not allow me to chair it. It produced a report generally supportive of the legal establishment and that's why they wanted somebody else to chair it. The fact is the Nebraska bar in recent years has shaken off several slabs of institutional torpor and self-protectionism. So improvements properly should be approvingly recognized. What also should be recognized is that the bar is a monopoly operation claiming for itself exclusive self-policing and self-regulating powers and on and on. But they talked about the role that I played in forcing the court to act. Do you know that before, that BC, before Chambers, a person taking the bar exam, if he or she flunked it, could not see his or her exam or be given a reason as to why they flunked. The actual questions could never be made available to the public and there was no appeal. All of those things go against what this country supposedly stands for. What about making all of this secret? Harry Truman said something to the effect that secrecy and democratic government cannot coexist. Everybody talks about the right to appeal a negative, a negative decision against an individual, whether it's on a job and in court, but a student who allegedly flunked the bar exam could not appeal. So I brought a bill to do all those things. And while what I was trying to do was criticize and condemn, guess what happened? I got a letter and it started, dear Senator Chambers, knowing your interest in legal matters, bar matters, I thought I should bring this to your attention, <clears throat> excuse me, immediately. The bar under the court's guidance adopted some rules, it's called rule 10. A student who fails an exam is entitled to view his or her exam, which you couldn't before, and appeal the failing grade, which you couldn't before. The actual questions on the exam will be made public, which never was done before. All of the things that I was bringing in my legislation was done through the courts. And it's rule 10. So all these white people who hate me for practicing law have rights and privileges because the one they hate was willing to do that. When I say that, I mean the heavy lifting. Let me read an article that was written after I came back from being term limited the first time. And I told them they made me their God. I'm their alpha and their omega. I was the first one. Oh, and I said, in Revelations, God refers to himself as Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I was the first one, the Alpha, to be term limited and come back. There can only be one first. I am the Omega, the last, because due to term limits, nobody would ever serve in the legislature again as long as I did. So I said, you made me your God. I'm your Alpha and Omega, and there's nothing you can do about it. The headline of this article, Chambers Returns Doesn't Disappoint. It was dated June 9th, 2013. Omaha Senator Ernie Chambers returned to the Nebraska legislature in January and kept his promises. He educated, he frustrated, he sermonized, he lectured, quote, Daddy Warbucks doesn't need you. Little Orphan Annie does. 
but you always kowtow to Daddy Warbuck, Buck said Chambers. He defined daily unpredictability. Excuse me. <laughs> you probably never saw anybody hide a sneeze like that, did you? Well, it's better than me spraying everything. He lit up the lexicon, labeling factions of his fellow senators as cliqueites, clackites, troglodytes, referring to pinhead states and pipsqueak public officials. He challenged, quote, I get sick and tired of all these hypocrites running around here talking about the federal government is too big, reduce the size of government. Then who do they go to with their hands stuck out all of the time? If there's a drought in Nebraska, who are they going to go to? Not Ghostbusters, not to the Tea Party. Early in the session, some senators who never had experienced the Ernie Chambers way, who were accustomed to quick debates and a fast moving agenda when Chambers was not there due to term limits, ran to Speaker Greg Adams, demanding he take control of Chambers and stop his long-winded speeches. Those who know Ernie know nobody controls Ernie, Speaker Adams said. The speaker waited and watched, and it wasn't long before those senators who wanted to shut him up on one issue were yielding him time on another. I reminded those people, said Adams, see how this works? Chambers frequently sang from the session soundtrack. I call myself the burglar of music because I often break into song. Anyway, you've got to give a little, take a little, and let your poor heart break a little. That's the story of, that's the end glory of the political process. The middle of the session bogged down, some believed in part because of Chambers' concern about the local option sales tax that passed in 2012 and the potential that low-income constituents would have to pay more in taxes once cities voted in the plan. The local option meant that cities could impose a sales tax if they chose to, but they didn't have to. That had to be resolved. Omaha Senator Brad Ashford said that it has to be resolved. And when it was, to my satisfaction, that unclogged the session. Senator Chambers doesn't ask this body to do a whole lot. He doesn't introduce a lot of bills, Ashford said. His main function is to work with the bills that are introduced by others, unquote, to point out their weaknesses, to change and improve what he can and to kill what needs to die. I quote, I might push pe people to the edge of the cliff, but I won't push them over unless it's necessary, Chambers said. He returned to the Capitol because he couldn't let the legisl his legislative career end by being bounced out of office by voters who didn't like him and who didn't live in his district. They could change the state constitution by adding term limits, but they couldn't keep him out, he said. On his return, he found the legislature to be more fractured than before he left. Quote, there was more cohesiveness before among those who were backward, he said. Chambers first came to the legislature in his 30s. While he was angry at times and still is, he never was motivated by anger, he said. It consumed too much energy. Anger, the way I look at it now, it's a feeling of such indignation and outrage about something, but doesn't have to be that way. You're so upset about it that you're going to speak against it. Then you're going to find a way to work against it and correct it if you can. If he could go back and advise that young black man living in North Omaha, he said he would not try to alter his course in the least. He would let his life unfold just the way it has, and talking about me when I was young. On second thought, there is one thing you would tell him. 
When you go to a store that sells those short sleeve sweatshirts, buy 100 of them because they're not going to always make them. That's the regret. And I have much more that I'm not going to read, that I'm not going to talk about, because as the canary said, when they told him the door to his cage was open, I'm out of here. Thank you for watching The Ernie Chambers Show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication Production.